Hey, everybody, welcome to the Jib Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. How is everybody doing today? Good to see all your smiley faces. Welcome to our Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series, where we are bringing back the lost art of conversation with incredible guests, live interactivity with our viewers who are watching from around the world. They are called the Lovety Squad. Matter of fact, if you would like to comment, right now in our exclusive JMS live chat room. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is the one you're watching right now. That is Jim Masters TV. Click that red subscribe button, really easy to do. And then you're a part of the JMS Lovety family. You're part of our great community. You see that red button there on our YouTube channel. Click that, click the notification bell so you never miss any of our incredible episodes. We've done over 640 episodes so far of our series day in and day out. It's really cool. Don't forget to give this episode and all the ones you enjoy a hearty thumbs up, like our YouTube channel, and leave a comment on the YouTube channel as well. So again, if you'd like to comment, because uh, I can see the comments, our guests can see the comments, you guys can chat amongst yourselves like our lovely squad likes to do. Subscribe to the YouTube channel and you have that exclusive as well. There's no cost. So it's really, really cool. We have an amazing guest joining us. Yes, Marianne Alda is joining us from Chicago, from the the Windy City. She is a beloved daytime soap star for many, many years. Edge of Night, Guiding Light, Sunset Beach, of course, many other shows, television, The Royal Family with Red Fox and Della Reese, lots more. And she's also a wonderful speaker. She is an advocate uh, to fight ageism. She believes in uh, aging shamelessly, and it's really a beautiful project. She has done TEDx talks. Uh, she's revered. She's beloved, and she's funny. She's also a comedian. Did you know that too? If you've only known her for the soap opera roles that have been iconic and prolific, she's also a comedian <laughs> and she's very funny we're so honored to have her here on the show she's going to join us live and direct from chicago in just a second gang it's so nice to have you here this is your first time sampling the gym master show live entertainment lifestyle talk show series you can binge watch all the episodes over 640 with guests from broadway hollywood television film music stage culinary arts sports comedy everything life in general a very special guest, Marianne Alda, became one of the first African-American daytime soap opera heroines back in 1981. The feisty young criminal defense attorney, Dee Dee Bannister, on ABC's Edge of Night. But these days, she's prosecuting ageism with a TEDx talk, a solo show, and as an AARP age disruptor. Don't you just love that? Her 30-year television career, which again, prolific and extraordinary and iconic. The highlights also include co-starring opposite Red Fox and Della Reese as their daughter Elizabeth on the CBS sitcom, The Royal Family. Also recurring as Lita Ford, Anthony's yuppie from Hell Girlfriend on CBS's Designing Women. Yep. Co-starring opposite OJ Simpson as his wife, Ellen, for three seasons on the HBO dramedy, First and Ten. Yeah. Again, I know a lot of you know her for the soaps, but she's done so much more. And of course, she was on uh, NBC's Sunset Beach as well. And a lot of other incredible productions, incredible shows, and so much more. Most recently, her solo show, Get Old as a Bitch, But I'm Gonna Wrestle That Bitch to the Ground, broke a 30-year box office record. That's right, at the 2019 National Black Theater Festival, which is amazing. I mean, that's extraordinary. And uh, that was, again, picked up for a sold-out run at New York's historic Billy Holiday Theater in the pre-pandemic 2020. Up next, she stars in the indie short film Gumbo, written and directed by S.C. Waters and produced by Gino Brooks and their artistic uh, standard for AMC's all black TV, really incredible. I tell you, it's this is a, an extraordinary career on so many different levels, the versatility and also her passion. You know what I mean? Uh, she's somebody who really cares about people. She's empathetic and she likes to make a difference and inspire people. She's inspired many people through her work, you know, her prolific work on television and, and stage and film and everything. But, uh, 
She goes the extra mile in the, in the incredible projects that she's a part of today. We're very honored and excited to welcome her to the show. I see all these comments coming in here, gang. You're the best. Keep those comments coming. Again, if you'd like to post during the show while it's live, if you'd like to chat, make a comment, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. You have that opportunity to do that. And you can also leave a comment on the show uh, YouTube channel as well underneath this episode, live and direct from Chicago. There she is. Looking Hi, Jim. A million bucks. <laughs> Hi, Marion. How are you? Yeah, it's two million. It's inflation. Two, <laughs> that's right. Yesterday it was a million. Today it's Today two, two million. million. <laughs> so you're there. You're back home in the Windy City. How are you, my friend? Yeah. That's Thanks for coming and gracing us with your wonderful uh, presence today on the show. We appreciate it. Oh, it's more than my pleasure. And if you don't mind, I'd like to give a shout out to Lisa Rodrigo, who made the connection. She said, yeah. oh, you've got to be on the show. He's, he's fabulous. And and I think so, so far from what I've gathered from watching your shows, I think she's right. So I am honored to be here. Oh, it is my pleasure. I'm so excited to have you here. And again, I've always admired your work and your tenacity and your passion. Um, and you're involved in so many incredible things now, which I think is so beautiful. But before we get to some of that, let, let's talk, let's go back in time uh, to those early 80s. Mm -hmm. What were some of those it was inspirational moments for you early on in your career, Marianne, that really guided you into the direction of wanting to become a, a creative artist, a performer, an entertainer, somebody who's a storyteller, uh, as an actress, mm -hmm. and so much more. Well, we're going to have to go back earlier than that. Let's go back to the 1950s. I was born in 1948. Do the math. I'm 73. <laughs> okay. Um, and. I loved watching the Mickey Mouse Club. That was my oh, favorite show yeah. on television in the 50s. And um, I, there wasn't a lot of people who looked like me on television at that time. Mm. And as a little kid, you don't know race, you don't know ethnicity, but you know, you know, colors. And yeah. I could see uh, that Annette Funicello was like my color. She had curly black hair. Um, and I thought, Oh, I want to be like that. I want to be in the Mickey Mouse Club. And that really sparked an interest in me in wanting to, first of all, I was a very, you know, rambunctious kid. You know, my parents put me in dance classes and drama classes and just to get me out of the house. I yeah. think. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then when I was in high school, I was in a, a dance company I, and I performed for the basketball games. It's kind of like a version of the cross between the Laker girls and the June Taylor dancers oh, yeah. or the Rockettes. You know, we did a lot of high kicks. Yes. Um, and then in college, I went to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. I toured with the Southern Illinois, uh, Illinois University Theater. Now, my parents had come up from the South, from the Jim Crow South to Illinois, to, to Chicago, to give my sister, and me, well, my sister and I weren't born then, but yeah. for their future children, a better life. Yeah. And so, and so I'm a first generation college graduate and we have a lot of school teachers and nurses, you know, in our family. So the, my parents' dream was, you know, take some education courses, you know, you can do that, you know, be a teacher. And that was pretty much the, the peak of their aspiration for me. And I rebelled by yeah. not taking any education classes. So I had concentrations in both theater and journalism, but no one in my family, you know, had gone into the entertainment industry. I thought, what's wrong with me that, you know, am I a show off? What's wrong with me? that I would uh, want to be an actor. I, so it took me a while to come out of the closet and admit that I wanted to do that. What helped me was discovering Carl Jung, mm. the this, this psychologist Carl Jung, yeah. who said that we are genetically predisposed, you know, that our desires, our, our, our DNA speaking up saying, 
we can do this, we can do that. This is what, this is how we want to express ourselves. And so the natural gifts and the natural talents that I have as a storyteller, as a performer, as somebody with a lot of energy and a need, you know, and passion and purpose. Yes. Um, what else was I going to do with that? You know, <laughs> but became an actor. Um, were there others in the family that were also in this area no, or were you the breakout? No, I'm the black sheep of the family. You want to do what? <laughs> At least I was the black sheep until I got on television. Then it's like, oh, my daughter is on television. <laughs> you know, but until then, when I was doing all kinds of, you know, theater for no money, um, yes. you know, Broadway yeah. and Paying your dues oh, and getting the experience and right. building um, the credits. Yeah. You know, my parents thought, what a waste of a college education. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but then I was, uh, my big breakthrough for my mother was yeah. that uh, I did a total cereal commercial. Yeah. And they put me on the back of the cereal box. And my, I don't know how many boxes that damn cereal we had in the house because my mother would go through the checkout line and say, this is my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> she loves it. This is my daughter. I mean, forget about doing theater. I did a play with Ossie Davis and Ruby D. She could have cared less, but it being was. on the back of a cereal box, <laughs> that was it. She was, you know, I was a star. <laughs> and did you guys eat total cereal normally or did you start eating total cereal as a result. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I don't know what they ate. I don't think, I think they were big Cheerios people. Yeah. Um, but I actually did, I was eating the cereal before I even, you know, got the commercial because it was healthy. Yes. I, I don't even know if they make it anymore. Yeah. Do they? I don't That's know. Good question. Yeah. Because I haven't, I don't, you know, if they, if they still make it, it's on the lower shelf at the supermarket. So I never see it. Um, yes. So no, I, um, I, I eat raisin bran. Do better. America says Marianne is amazing, smart, funny, talented, a longtime friend. And she sings Dom and Kay. Hi, Casey. Oh! Isn't that great. Hello. That, well, that happens to be my, my manager and oh, Don and Kay. Welcome. <laughs> let me, let me tell you about Don and Kay. As a matter of fact, we have to come back on your show. You have to bring me back. Oh, because I course. just finished this wonderful project um, called Ben and Tony. It's a sitcom for grownups. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of the cast is over 70. The director is over 70. Uh, Sasha Schneider, who won an mm -hmm. Emmy Award for um, uh, Hill Street Blues. So this sitcom that he directed, I think of it as getting over the getting defying the over the hill street blues um yeah, right. because which we will talk about later about ageism yes. uh, which is my passion mm -hmm. but anyway about let me plug this project because i that's what i was doing in in la um i can't say too much about it really except that dominic oliver it starts dominic oliver and donald watson and myself um as I play a div divorcee who happened to have been married to both of these two men. And I think that's all I can say, except that I'm a bit of a B word, rhymes with which, um, but kind of um, self-involved, very much like the character I played on Designing Women, very much like Lita Ford. So she's, she's uh, outwardly kind of, um, kind of a, snippy person but i think i think you will find as we go along in the show that she has a heart and um so we we finished that making that uh sitcom pilot presentation in la and we're going to be shopping it around soon yes. and uh, i would love it if you would bring dom and donald and and mm. uh, and um sasha we could all come on and kind of talk about that a little bit from a Love different it. point of view. Okay. Let's, let's do that. We will let's have book it, Dan we will keep the porch light on for all of you, as we okay. always say on the okay. show. Great idea. Congratulations on that. You know, we, we've we've gone through some, and I've mentioned it and we've chatted about it with some of the guests who've come in, you know, to the show stopping by, which we love. It's been really an interesting time for all of us on so many different levels. And what we've gone through, you know, with uh, the pandemic situation and all, 
um, it's been a time to really pause, breathe, reboot, refresh, reconnect, reassess, and, and try to maybe come out of this. I keep saying rise from the ashes with more kindness, more empathy, more connection, less division, and really work together and understand that we all need each other. We're all here. The earth spins a lot smoother on its axis when we were all here working together, caring about one another. And we've had this time to see all of these things go on around us that have been global, I mean, have been extraordinary, but yet at the same time, look in the mirror and say, who is that? What's the reflection that I'm seeing? We've had a couple of guests say, and some of them in the acting realm as well, that they've always had all these roles that they've played and they've nailed them. But this situation we've had the last two years has given them opportunity to look in the mirror and say, who am I now? Now, who am actually I out of all of this? So a lot of people have had sort of like a, almost a rebirth through all of this that has gone on. How about you? What are some of the teachable moments and the things that you have learned about yourself during all of this, Marianne? Hmm. Well, I'm going to go back to, um, because I kind of got away from the question that you asked me about <clears throat> my getting started in this, in this business. Um, my father said to me, now keep in mind, I was a child of the 50s and he had been, had grown up in the Jim Crow South. He impressed upon me because you're a little colored girl, you're going to have to work 10 times as hard as those other folks to get the same things. And he said it without any malice or bitterness, just as a matter of fact. And that's the way I took it. Um, it, it wasn't fair, but if I waited for the world to catch up to what's fair, um, I'd be waiting forever. I wanted to be part of the change. And so when, as a young actress, I was always very conscious of the roles that I took so that they would be uplifting and positive uh, expressions of people of color. And now fast forward, now that I am a, uh, an older actress, now that I'm mature, I'm very conscious of the same thing for older people. Because these days, a lot of this, the reason why you haven't seen that much of me on television is that a lot of the scripts that I get, the women, the characters are one of three things. One of three C's. She's a cripple, she's a curmudgeon, or she's crazy. Uh, there is a stereotype that is prevalent in film and television where older people are the butt of the joke. You know, we're the sight gags. Yeah. And uh, that is so derogatory. And um, when the casting director stopped calling me, like in my mid 50s, because they could do the math and it didn't make any difference if I looked like I was 35, they knew I was 50 and they weren't going to hire me for the roles for certain things. Um, and I pivoted and became a hypnotherapist because I think actors have a natural curiosity about human behavior and motivation. We have to do that kind of inner work so that we can portray uh, the complexity of characters. So I became a hypnotherapist and a lot of my clients were women in their late 40s, early 50s, and they were all suffering from depression. Mm. And my practice was in Tarzana, California, which is a very upscale neighborhood. Yes. So the, these women wanted for nothing. They had money, they had beautiful homes, they were now empty nesters, and they were unhappy. Mm. And I soon realized that we have all, men and women, yeah. been hypnotized into believing that women lose value and social and sexual currency as we get older. And a funny thing happened is that as I was giving the positive suggestions to my clients, the suggestions took root into my own subconscious mind right. so that I had to walk my talk. It's like, yes, you can be everything and you want. Well, hey, Marianne, so can you. Right. And what, do you, what is it that you really want? Right. What I really want is to, is to act. I mean, I love doing this. I'm a natural storyteller. I'm a natural communicator. When I play a character, my motivation is always to enlighten or inform people, you know? So people will look at people at a different way and wonder, 
oh, maybe that's why they were acting that way. Um, so they, they'll have a better understanding of human nature. You right. know, it's like I, as an actor, it's not about, oh, look at me, look at me. No, it's like, listen to me, listen exactly. to me and look right. inside. Yes. Look inside. That's what yes. I want people to do. That's that's why I love doing this. And so when they stopped hiring me for film and television, I started hiring myself. My very first one woman show I did at the Hypnosis Motivation Institute in Tarzana, California, which is where I trained to become a hypnotherapist. And the title of my show was Snap Out of It. You've only been hypnotized into believing you're over the hill. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the feedback that I got from audiences let me know the importance of the work that I'm doing. I look at, I think of my acting as my ministry. You know, I, I minister to the hearts and souls of people who, um, you know, who say, hey, who might feel badly about getting older and thinking that their life is over and, and there's, you know, and, and feel uncomfortable about the fact that they're overlooked or uh made fun of and i just mm. i want them to feel better about it you know get considering the alternative right getting Which old is not, not too bad <laughs> <laughs> the alternative is total silence and uh, not ready for that <laughs> no. well uh we have something here that will trigger some memories for uh for our fine audience here, the Lovities. They have already said, which you and I were chatting about before we went live on the air, about how I said that the show has a lot of light, love, and levity. And I said it too fast, you know, two years ago. And I said, Lovity. And that just really, you know, grabbed a hold of the show. They call me Mr. Lovity. This is Lovity Hall. And the uh, viewers call themselves the Lovity Squad. They've already said you're a Lovity. So how does Yay! that? Isn't I that love cool? it. Cool. I love it yet. <laughs> like I say, there's Peabody's and Oscars and Tellies and Emmys and Tonys and Grammys. But when you get a lovely on the Jim Masters show live, that must really, are your feet tingling right I'm, now? I'm, I'm accepting my, my award as the, as the lovely, my, my bottled water here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone who made this possible to all the loveties out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you are very, very welcome. We, uh, we have, uh, some clips from over the years with an on-camera reel that is going to spark okay. some really cool memories here for everybody. We'll take a look at that, and then uh, we'll continue our fabulous conversation. Marianne, a, a blessing to have you here. And uh, gang, get ready. This is going to take you down uh, Nostalgic Avenue here on the Gym Master Show Live with uh, Marianne Alder through the years. From ABC News. This is Nightline. Marianne Alder was a featured player in the royal family, an early CBS attempt to build a show around a predominantly black cast. That's what I wanted to tell you. But I don't understand. I knew you wouldn't understand. No, baby, your daddy mean we didn't understand what you said. You know you sure look fine. Oh, hello, Mary Ann. You know you sure look fine. Oh, hello, Mary Ann. I could love you all the time. And you must be Nicole Parker and her friend Andrell Wilkerson? Charmed, I'm sure. <laughs> Let me introduce you to the other members. Uh, ladies, I'd like for you to meet... Um, is it Ms. or Mrs.? Ms. Oh. <laughs> Ladies, please welcome Ms. Parker and, um... And Del Wilkerson, her single and available friend. So if... Yeah, well, why don't you just mingle? Over there. He pulled through. But he's going to need months of therapy. Just happened before? He's a little accident prone. Mm -hmm. That's why we all took the kitty CPR class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the record reflect the defendant, Avery Walker, and his counsel. Maxi Sparks. I thought Alonzo Sparks was the attorney of record. I'm his son. He must be very proud. I'll never give you another job. They'll send you right back to being a delivery man. Director of transportation. Delivery man. <laughs> You've been the best part of my life these last three years. Are you going to stand there and tell me that your work is more important to you than your personal life? Yeah, I guess I am. Who 
Anthony, that's what I was waiting for you to say. Put that career first, and there's nothing we can't do. You are going to be the black Donald Trump. I just know it. Oh, Lita, you're so weird. I'm so glad to meet you, Mr. Lackey. For some reason, I feel like we've met before. I don't think so. I probably have one of those faces. Vanessa, listen to me. There's something I have to tell you. It is not funny. You boys want to tell me what's so funny about that? What is so funny about stealing liquor? I'm on the refreshment committee. <laughs> That's your father. You told him? Answer it. Ridiculous. Oh, my. Can I help you? Designs for living. From first home to ultimate dream house. Idea hunting with Mary Ann Alda. Suppose this house was your house and you wanted to change it. Make it the wonderful, imaginative house you always wanted. What could you do? Well, you could call the Connecticut architectural firm of Moore, Grover, and Harper and ask for Mark Simon. He says it's a challenge, but... When you see me stare my test, when you see me stare my test, when you see me do my best, when you see me do my best... This is what I suggest you say the next time somebody tries to drop a dime on you because of your standards. <laughs> You cannot treat a thoroughbred the same way you treat a plow horse and expect to maintain the same high quality thoroughbred that I When you see that, well, that was a trip in the Wayback Machine, wasn't it? Wasn't it? And a beautiful <laughs> one as well. Just reminding people of your versatility and just all the different opportunities that have come your way that you've worked hard for. Um, what was the first one? What was that linchpin opportunity early on that sort of set the ball in motion where producers and casting people, directors, said she's good we want her we want to bring her in on this project on this show on this production what was that first thing that really you look back at and say if that was the thing that really set it in motion for me career-wise okay this is going to sound strange but i don't think i don't think there is ever any one thing that ever sent set anything in motion i think after i did every job it was always back to square one and i was trying to get the next one yeah it was um especially for uh, a black an african-american actress you know at that time there there weren't a lot of roles there were a lot of people and i got a lot of kind of crazy feedback um was i black enough was i too black was i blah, 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 blah. you know there was a lot of that um so I was just grateful to get every every job that I got, um, and I celebrated every one. But for me, the one that was most significant was when I got cast to do a play with Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee, oh, yeah. because they were, you know, my idols, and they were just the most wonderful human beings. And as big a star as they stars as they were, they were also very humble and very gracious, and. As a young actor, I took, I took how I was supposed to act from them. Mm -hmm. You know, I right. so I never got a big hit because these were like it was Ossie Davis and Ruby D, and they were so humble and so kind. And so uh, that's how I wanted to uh, to conduct my career as an actor. And I and I made a point. I think it's the hardest thing for any actor to do is to be a guest star on somebody else's show yes always because you're coming in it's like you're the new kid on the block you don't know anybody and in order to do your best work as an actor you have to be confident yes and a lot of times when you have the nerves the confidence goes out the door so um following what i learned from ozzy and ruby whenever anybody would come on a show where i was a lead like um the royal family or edge of night 
I kind of was like the cruise director on the love boat. Oh, I would go yes. up to them and say, welcome, and try to make them feel comfortable. And uh, so that they would, so they could do their best work. And I think that, that that's really, really important. But I would say, so that was uh, doing the play with Ossie Davis and Ruby D. Uh, and then I got a chance to do the whiz with, mm. um, with, with Miss Diana Ross. Mm. Funny story about that. Um, I was doing a lot of TV commercials at the time and I lived in the Bronx. And so whenever I had to go into the city, if I had time in between, you could, you know, carry your portfolio around and visit casting directors or agencies. <clears throat> and I was in town and I uh, was in between auditions and I saw that, uh, uh, Joy Todd, uh, Todd Champion Casting was having an open call. So I went in, I got off the elevator. There, the door was open. A lot of actors were sitting outside on folding chairs. The door, and, and I come out of the hall and Joy Todd is looking right at me and she goes, the young mom. And I had no idea what she was talking about. Her partner at the time, Fern Champion says, nah, she's too old. Now I was what? 26 at the time, something like that, 25, 26. And I thought, too old to play a young mom. I don't know what got into me, but I had my little portfolio. I marched through the door. I followed her back into her office and I said, what do you mean too old? Look, here's my portfolio. Today I'm auditioning for a Tidy Bowl commercial, but I can do Pampers. I can do young mom. And I'm rub thumbing through my portfolio. <laughs> and so she goes, she throws up her hands and says, okay, 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 okay. You know, and then she turns to her assistant and said, give her, give her an, give her an appointment tomorrow. <laughs> so Joy, I mean, that was Joy, that was Fern Champion. Yeah. Joy Todd, her partner who had said, young mom, comes out of, I'm walking past her office. She goes, psst, psst, come here. Sit. She says, come here. She says, can you get a baby? I said, what? She said, can, can you get a baby for the audition tomorrow? <laughs> I said, well, my son is two. He's not a baby anymore, but I'll mm -hmm. see what I can do. So I, the next day I showed up at the audition and we were grouped in, you know, in couples, the husband and wife, and then the grandparents, husband and wife. So we were grouped in fours. And so I had gotten a bunny rabbit and I had a receiving blanket. And I just wrapped the bunny rabbit in the receiving blanket and I was just, you know, holding the baby. <laughs> so they call <laughs> us in to meet, to meet Sydney Lamette, the director. Mm. And there was there were no lines or anything. There was no pages, no sides to read. You know, we just he just talked to us and I'm just, you know, feeling the baby. So I'm just answering him and he's just talking very lovely. So at the end of it, he says, well, thank you so much. It was so great for all of you to come in. And then he leans over to me. He says, boy, that's a really good baby. A baby slept through the whole thing. And I went, <laughs> da -da. I said, you mean this? And he goes, he falls down and he starts laughing. He said, oh my God, it's a rabbit. And I said, why, of course, Mr. Lamette, I was acting. That's what it's all about. That's right. He said, I, I thought you had a real baby in there. <laughs> And he just <laughs> fell out laughing and I got the job. Wow. Now, I can't guarantee that's why I got the job, but I think it probably was. I think he could not get that moment out of his head and said, that, you know, that girl, you know, the one with the rabbit. That girl. That girl. Yes. <laughs> See, and they thought Marlo Thomas was that girl. You were that girl. I was that girl. <laughs> and working with him. And then I learned another valuable lesson from Diana Ross, mm. uh, who was also, you know, I've heard rumors. She was lovely to me. Um, and she was gracious to everyone in the in the cast. And we had a scene a couple of weeks later after we shot the opening, the big Thanksgiving scene. And it was just uh, Diana Ross, Teresa Merritt, the man who played the cab driver, mm -hmm. and um, uh, my husband and myself. I think we did it for a couple of days because I think there was one day that it was just really Diana and me. They called me out of the trailer, my trailer, and they were creating an exterior scene where I was supposed to go into the brownstone and it was Thanksgiving. So there's lots of snow. They had all this snow and wind and stuff like that. So Diana is sitting on a director's chair on the set. 
and they call me out, but they're not ready for me yet. You know, they call you out and then you stand around while they still and then set you up stand the shop. Around, right. right. And you still so, can't touch craft services yet either. <laughs> right. <laughs> So she's sitting there and I'm standing next to her and we're having a lovely conversation. All of a sudden her eyes got really steely and she looks at me and then she looks around and then suddenly she says, don't you see a lady standing here? Get her a chair. And then she looked at me and gave me that little, you know, sister girl. Like, I got you, sister. I got, you know, she gave me that little nod. Yeah. And I just, and I was just really moved by that because she didn't have to luck out for me, but she did. But she did. Yeah. Wow. That's really, really important to have somebody to do something like that. That really sticks with you. So yeah. some of these things that were really got that ball rolling for you then, huh? And you were yeah. really you know, sinking your teeth into it and honing your skills and, and making the connections and getting it done. People were noticing you. And then how did it lead to the soap opera world? How did that become? Because you're so identified with that, even though you've done so many other things and continue to do wonderful things yeah. in this world. But the soap opera world during that time was it. I mean, soap opera fans know everything about the character the set the the theme song they know all about it and they are really in tune with it and sometimes they even i'm sure write in and say no i don't want you with him i don't like him i want you back with the other guy i mean they tell you they tell the writers how to write the story i don't i don't want her i don't like that girl write her out and you know uh, or, uh, or oh, I, I, I i can tell you a, a true story something that happened to me both good and not so good. Um, I was in the supermarket one day and I'm pushing my little cart and I see this, you know, little old lady, I guess I'm a little old lady now, but she was, she was, she was really little. And she looks at me and she nods and I smiles and, her and nod. I just nod. And then she comes up to me and I just figured she's a fan. She came up to me and she slapped me. She said, that Calvin Stoner, he's in love with you. Why aren't you nicer to him? And I'm, and here I'm in the supermarket saying, but he's married. He's married to another, well, he's married. I can't. It just, it just shocked me. That was my Chris Rock moment. It's I like, was just about like, to say like, just, yeah. Like, he's married, you know, because I, I didn't, it, it's funny. I didn't think to say, I'm just acting. I'm an actress. Yeah, I'm going like, no, you're, you're, he's married. Yeah, he's married. I can't. Yeah. And, you and know. Writers wrote those lines and I they, have to uh, say have, those lines. Yeah. I, I didn't even, I didn't, I was in shock. I didn't even think of that. All I could say is, but he's, but he's married. And he's, she, he's married. She was not having it. She walked away. She wanted you with Calvin, <laughs> she right? She wanted me with Calvin. And yeah. why was I so mean to him? Yes. Well, let's let's check that out. Calvin, uh, hi, Calvin. Hi, Sid. How's it going? Well, no use complaining, right? Hey, how's that big handsome partner of yours? Do you want to see him around much? <laughs> Damien. Well, he's uh he's on a special assignment. I guess they're keeping him pretty busy. Has that got anything to do with Jody's kidnapping? No, I wouldn't be the one to ask him that on that team. Hello, DZ. Hello, Calvin. Uh, well, listen, personally speaking, I hope that they grab the guy that uh, took Jody because, uh, well, we've got enough to worry about these days, what with the old-fashioned type criminals. Now we've got all these uh, international terrorists and bomb throwers and people like that to deal with. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, listen, uh, would uh, you two like something to drink to start with? Oh, nothing for me to say, thanks. I uh, wouldn't mind a nice cold beer. Right. Nice cold beer. Well, Calvin, this had better be good. You've been coming up with some pretty clever ploys lately to keep me on the string. Uh, uh, actually, Dee, the fact is that this is one of those times when I would really rather not be sitting on the opposite side of the table. Well, now that's a new approach. Look, um, you aren't going to like much of what I have to say. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's going to do much for my case. Calvin, would either. you please just get to the point? It's about your brother. I think 
that he is headed for some trouble, and I wanted you to be forewarned. Kevin, did you know that my brother is now gainfully employed, that he has a legitimate job? Oh, yes, now that I know. And do you know how hard it is to get a job these days? And my brother already has several strikes against him. First of all, he's young. He is black. He has no skill. And he's an ex-con. Okay, okay. Now, doesn't that make you wonder just a little bit how it was so simple for him to just run out and get on a payroll? What are you getting at, Calvin? Did he tell you where he was working, Dee? Yeah, I didn't think so. He said that he was working at, at some big company as an apprentice, a gopher. He's working at Lucky Salvage, Dee. He's working for Eddie Lorimer. And you know what he's about. All right, so he's working for a company that Eddie Lorimer owns. That doesn't mean that he's doing anything illegal. Dee Dee, parolees aren't allowed to work there, Calvin, didn't you? he's not on parole. He is free and clear, and he can work anywhere he likes, and I don't like what you're implying. Implying? I'm, I'm merely trying to warn you. Well, thank you. Okay? Thank you for your great concern. Do you mind explaining to me what all this is about? I'm only trying to be helpful, you know. Well, thank you again for your help, Calvin. But I can take care of my own brother. Why don't you just take care of your wife? Good job. And Little Calvin Smith. was looking out for you. Calvin was looking out for you. And that lady in the supermarket <laughs> thinks you should have stayed in that booth with him. <laughs> oh, my God. If looks could kill, he would have been a dead man. He obviously, <laughs> like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Oh, what my. was it like what? playing Dee Dee? I mean, obviously, you are so, you know, connected to that character. How did you, you know, the, the script writers are, are fantastic. They, they write the scripts. They think of the storylines and everybody puts it all together. But then you have to take those words and make them jump off the page and come to life. And, a, you know, a lot of times a performer takes little bits of themselves and sort of sprinkles it in to the character that's been created, the words that are on the page. Tell us about how you were able to take that character and just make her come to life and, and blossom and be so beloved. Uh I, I loved Dee Dee. I loved the character. Uh, she was, as a matter of fact, she was only supposed to be on the show for a three-month story arc to um, to create a love triangle between Calvin and his wife, Star. And somewhere around the middle of the second month, Nick Nicholson, who was the executive producer, came up to me and he said, how do you like being on the show, kid? I said, I, I, I like it fine. He said, um, yeah, we like it too. Have your agent call me. And I, you know, I got my first contract. And I started on the show in June of 81. And I remember going to the first Edge of Night Christmas party in uh, of December of 81. And I met Henry Slesser, who was the executive, who was the head writer of the show at the time. And Henry came up to me with a big smile on his face and he said, he said, I've been watching you. And I said, oh, thank you, Mr. Slusser. He said, yes, I've got big plans for Dee Dee. And I said, oh, he said, yes, I'm going to make you suffer because you suffer so well. <laughs> so I guess, <laughs> you know, so he's like, so, you know, because I get, you know, how, Soap operas are about, about high stakes melodrama. Absolutely, and, yeah. Um, and I had, you know, kind of, I think my today my mother would probably have been diagnosed bipolar or something. She was a little, it was kind of funky growing up <clears throat> when I was a kid. I never knew uh, what kind of mood my mother was going to be in. And so I, I think I learned to be 
empathic and sensitive to what's going to happen today. What's going to, what kind of mood is she in today? So I, I became very adapting to connecting to other people. And I think the real key to good acting is listening and responding, you know, being in the moment and listening and responding. So I think just paying attention to what the other actor was saying and feeding off of that, making sure that I was fully present in the scene with them. I think that's what, uh, I think that's really what, what makes people connect with, uh, with scenes. It's not just the characters, but it's the relationship that they have. I mean, Dee Dee did not exist in a vacuum. No. Dee Dee was a, a, a really invested in the in the town of Monticello with with my with my law partner, you know, Ernie Townsend who played Kill F. Nelson, with my roommate Leela Ivley who played you know played Mitzi, and I just invested myself in. I made myself a member of the community, yeah. and cared about all of the other people that I interacted with in the community. And I think that's what made it believable. Yes, absolutely. And again, you know, pulling from various experiences in your own life and elements of yourself and immersing it into the character is really a, a, a beautiful thing. And then there's Dee Dee and Julius, a doomed romance. Uh, <laughs> yes. Let's uh, let's take David a look. Pendleton. He was a wonderful actor, a great actor as well. Take a little clip of that, and we'll talk about that as well. Here it is, gang. Monticello, why? What's happened? Well, actually, it's a bit of good luck. I've been offered a position with a prestigious firm in Chicago. Julius, that's wonderful. I'm really happy for you. I'll have to give up some of the independence that I've enjoyed here, but in the long run, I'll gain a lot more in money and advancement. Congratulations, you deserve it. It sounds like a great opportunity. Well, congratulations are in order. But only if you'll come with me. If you'll say yes to my question. Julius, I really haven't had a chance to think... We could have a terrific life together in Chicago. It's a great town, you know? Everything in the world anyone can ask for in the way of opportunities. And the challenges are unlimited. But this is my home now. This is where I started to build my career, my partnership with Cliff. Dee Dee, what did Cliff do before you joined forces? And you can build a bigger career in Chicago. A big city has a bigger crime problem, and they need more and better good lawyers, you know. Don't you see? Oh, Julius, you make it sound tempting. I mean to. But that's not fair. It was a tough enough question to answer before, and now it's even twice as difficult. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it would be easy. It all seems so perfect. I'm sorry, too. But if you need your answer in a hurry, then the answer has to be no. <clears throat> well, uh, I'm not in that much of a hurry. Oh, Dee Dee, I, I, I don't want to complicate things when they're really very simple. I love you, that's all. Oh, Julius, I'm so sorry. I guess I just need more time. Is it, um... Well, I, uh... I haven't actually accepted the position yet. In fact, if you make, uh, staying here a condition, then so be it. I'll take you, Dee Dee, not the job. Oh, poor Dee Dee. <laughs> <laughs> poor Dee Dee. <laughs> <laughs> poor Julius. <laughs> Paul Julius is right, absolutely. I tell you. <laughs> but I'm when feeling you're feeling so bad. You're feeling you want to go back and sort of rewrite things or uh, maybe maybe say yes to some or. No, I've been married and divorced twice. I'm not saying yes again. No, anymore. that's it. You've been there, done that. And uh, 
That, that's really cool. Uh, Merlin in Canada says, I want more. They're, they're, they're loving it, everybody. These are all the Lovities commenting. Hey, Lovities. Uh, Toby <laughs> says, is, is there a dog curled up on Marianne's couch? Oh, no, no, no. This is, a, this, is a, this is a pillow. Sometimes I sleep on the couch. And this is a pillow that it has pop. Wait a second. Can you see it? It has, uh, it's like popcorn and then uh, movie tickets and, uh, you know, and a clip. So, yeah, that's my, that's Very my, cool. you're in the, this is for when I have movie nights. This is when you have movie, movie nights. nights. And I fall asleep at the movies. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course, guiding light uh, was another opportunity for you as well, huh? Yes. I played, um, I was an oncologist. I was, um, whose oncologist was I? Who had cancer on the show? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember one of the, one of the, one of the boys had cancer and yeah. I played their oncologist. Um, they had just called me. I was living in LA and I went back to do guiding light, but I wasn't under contract and it was pilot season in LA. So I went back to LA. I, you know, I left Johnny Bauer, Johnny Bowers, Johnny Johnny Bowers, Bowers. Uh, <clears throat> oncologist. <clears throat> and uh, again, the cast was lovely. I was, it was another Procter and Gamble show. Edge of Night was a Procter and Gamble show. So I was part of that, uh, P and G family. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, I've been very fortunate to be able to play. And then of course there was Sunset Beach. Sunset Beach and NBC. Yes. Yes. Where I played the tragically disfigured Lena Hart. Yes. And, uh, that was you know, two and a half hours a day in makeup. To get that to for get the that. makeup. Wow. And then another hour to remove it because they had to take bits and pieces and alcohol and uh, so I didn't pull my skin off. I had an allergic reaction to it. Um, and uh, so then they diminished my appearances because what are we going to do? Except when the show was off the air, I played Sherry Somm's mother and she and Jason George, they were going to get married. Mm. And so they thought, well, let's bring mom out of the asylum. I <laughs> show up to the, their apartment. I open the door and she says, mom, you're cured. And I go, yes, it's a miracle. <laughs> 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 and that's soap opera for you. That's but, incredible. Uh, yeah. yeah well, that was fun. <laughs> that's, that was fun. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a really good, interesting role as well. We got a little clip of um, you on Sunset Beach as well. Before I pronounce you husband and wife. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like mother, like daughter. We're just heartbreakers, aren't I we? I was going to tell you. Gee, it doesn't matter the network. CBS, NBC, ABC, wherever. Um, but really cool looking back. You know, I would imagine that, you know, as much as the viewers become very attached to a program, especially soap operas, because, you know, 30 year runs with a lot of these shows. So they're there for, it's a generational thing. And they get so wrapped up in the characters, the storyline, all of it. But as the performer, how do you, when a storyline ends or when the soap opera ends, when things wrap up for you or for the program collectively how do you move on from that a role that you've played for a long time how do you how do you emotionally detach from these characters that you've poured so much into and that people identify you with it must there must be some sort of a, a, a soft loss for the performer as well, because you're so invested in the character and then, you know, time passes on the character either leaves or the show, you know, wraps up. What is that experience like for you? Well, you're invested in the character. You're also invested in the paycheck. <laughs> um, but uh, the thing about edge of night is that when, is that the show itself was canceled. So there were a lot of us that were out of work at the same time. And so we clung to one another uh, and several of us made uh, moved to LA 
Um, uh, I did, let's see, uh, Jennifer Taylor. Uh, I think Sharon Gabbard stayed in New York for a while, but uh, a, a lot of the actors moved to Los Angeles and we, we formed a little community. You know, we looked out for each other. We supported each other. We celebrated whenever anybody got a job. Uh, so I think so I think it made it easier on me because I, I wasn't like set off, uh, you know, on an ice floe out into the sea on my own. Right. You know, <laughs> we were all on that Titanic together. Yeah. Uh, and we got it. So we got into the lifeboat together and we just, you know, we just held on. So I think that that helped. Now, in terms of emotionally detaching from the character. Yeah. Uh, there's a part of Didi that still resides inside of me because she is me. I, I, I created her. Uh, I have fond memories of her and the life that I was able to breathe into that character. So there will always be a soft spot in my heart for Dee Dee. I can look back at her and look like she's my child now. Yes. Oh, look at Dee Dee. Right. Uh, and also the tremendous satisfaction of creating a character that meant so much to so many people especially in the African-American community, because Dee Dee was, um, she was a lawyer. She was smart and she was feisty and she had romances and she had trials and tribulations. She was a full, bl full blown uh, soap opera heroine. And um, uh, something happened when I had been on this show, I think about maybe six or seven months. And I used to go to, religious services at either Avery Fisher or Alice Tully Hall in Lincoln Center. They had Science of the Mind or uh, Unity. So I would alternate between those two services. And afterwards, I would go to a little coffee shop across the street to have breakfast. So one day I walked in <clears throat> and it was like a, you know, a, a shotgun coffee house. You could walk in, you could see, you know, there are booze on either side and you could see back to the, to the back of the room. I walked in and there is a, an, a, an older black woman sitting in the back of the coffee house. She sees me when I, I come in and she kind of looks at me and I smiles and I looked at her and I nod. I went to have my breakfast and my back was facing the wall. It was, I was facing the, um, the door. So she was walking out the door. So she had to turn around to face me. She was walking out the door. She turned around and faced me. And she was, she was not very tall because I was sitting, she was standing and she wasn't that much taller than me. She leaned down, she cupped my chin in her hands and she said, oh baby, it's so good to see you on that show. And she had tears in her eyes. Um, that's how important that character was for so many people. And so, and I was, I still take great, pride in having created that character that meant so much to so many people. That's a beautiful story. That's a beautiful way of looking at it, knowing that, yeah, people feel so connected to the character and still, you know, talk about the character even today, which is extraordinary. Um, you know, even beyond all of these, uh, I mean, we have some fabulous photos here. <laughs> <laughs> There she is. She's giving that look to somebody. I don't know who, but <laughs> it's all in the eyes. It's, it's all it, in the eyes. It's all in those eyes. Abs absolutely. Here's another. Ah, and there's Beth. There's Dr. Beth Corral. I don't know. I was probably crying was over Calvin. Guiding. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, over Calvin. Here's another. Look at this one. Oh, that is from uh, Nobody's Perfect. I'm playing a tennis coach. I couldn't play tennis to save my life. Uh, but that's with Chad Lowe, who was impersonating a girl, so he could be on the tennis, on the girls' tennis team. Oh yeah, Chad Lowe. Yes, I remember Chad Lowe. Um, also, we found this too. It's kind of cool. Look at that. Oh yeah. Ah. Uh, yes. Determined, Marianne Alda. He <laughs> dared to dream big, and I'm still dreaming. I'm still. Look, wait a second. I can. Wait, 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 I'm trying to get my head. To... I sort of. <laughs> <laughs> the hair is a little different, but you know, I should, if I took my hair down, I could probably have that. Yeah. Of all the characters you've played, which one is the closest to who Marianne is? Hmm. 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 
I'd say Dee Dee is probably Dee Dee. close. Yeah. yeah, I'd say that she's probably close. Yeah, when you're playing a, a soap opera character and you're playing her daily, yeah, it helps to, for the for the character to be close to you mm-hmm. because you have to live with it a lot. So um, I, mean, I would say Dee Dee is probably the closest character to me. She's the one I have the most affinity for. Yeah, so. Dee Dee. Yeah. How did you, how did it come about where you had an opportunity to work with Red Fox, Della Reese and the Royal family on CBS? And, you know, just a few weekends ago, the Nostalgic Network Decades did an entire two day, 24 seven binge of all the episodes. Well, they do that on the weekends with classic series, which I think is really cool. Mary Tyler Moore, Rhoda, all the different ones. And they did it with the Royal family just I don't know, a month ago or so. Yeah. 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 So how did yeah. this come about for you as well? Working with uh, those icons and the rest of the, uh, the crew. Oh, it was, <laughs> I, it, it was an audition. I had an audition <clears throat> to go. It was probably one of the, um, it was an, it was an audition. I remember I lived in Woodland Hills in California <clears throat> And at the time, this was before the fax machines. And if you had an audition, you had to drive down to the studio, get the script, and then drop it. And it was, I got the call. It was rush hour. I was not about to spend, it was raining. I was not about to spend three hours in traffic going to the studio. And I thought, (laughs) I'll go early in the morning and I'll look at the script. So I go early, about a half an hour early, take a look at the script and I go, Oh, I could do this. This is mm-hmm. this is very close to me. And the reason I said that is because the character had a crying scene, which you show at the beginning, because that was that was pretty much the audition scene <clears throat> where uh, Elizabeth is crying and it says that you can't understand her. So I'm going to <laughs> you know, and I have had this thing that has that followed me all through high school of being the black Mary Tyler Moore, okay? Because, and so I would do the, <laughs> so I would do that. So that, that was kind of, that was a scene that was kind of written into that script. So I just going, <laughs> and the casting director laughed and she said, okay. So I think I had like maybe three more auditions, three or four more auditions. And finally I had a screen test at CBS. The other actress, who I will not name, it was down to between the two of us. The two of us were screen testing at CBS. We had to go down into the bowels of CBS on Beverly Boulevard. Um, there was a, a like a, a screening room. You had to walk through this door. It was all dark. And there were like 30 people back. You could not see them. <laughs> but they were back in the, you know, you just come up. Well, this other actress have been trying to get inside my head saying, well, I understand they want this. And I, you're really trying to mess mess with me. Like she said, well, I've had so many auditions this season and oh, blah, 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 blah. And I mm-hmm. thought, well, she, you know, you know that's how sometimes actors can be. So, and she wouldn't stop talking. She just kept really trying to mess with my head. That wasn't Shasha, was it? No, it wasn't Shasha. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna name names. Um, <laughs> Because since then, we've actually become friends. That's great. Um, uh, I don't hold a grudge. I got the job. So <laughs> the job, that's it. So, so anyway, I, I had to go in first. And when I did the, oh, the whole, everybody like burst into, into laughter. They were like laughing, you know. And then I came, I was standing at the door and, and, I, the director, I think, said, "Oh, do that again." And I went, oh, and they're laughing again. And then I opened the door, and she had to follow me to the sound of them laughing at me. And I looked into her eyes, and it was like deer in the head's life, head life, like, oh God, you know, God don't like ugly, right? Right. You know, that's why I, why, why be, you know, God has a way of, you know, taking care of His own revenge. So, well, yeah, I don't have to do it. You right, know? right. <laughs> so, so I, I got the job. And when I came out, uh, Eddie Murphy, who was the executive producer. That's right. His um, Uncle Lou, who was, you know, his like right hand guy, Uncle Lou came out from the 
from the, uh, I guess the back door of the studio, he came up to me, he said, you got it. You got mm -hmm. to, you know, now I didn't know this man. He, he didn't know. They, I think CBS had something, Paramount had something to do with to it. To do with it, right. Show. But he just said, yeah, you got it. So, um, wow. yeah, I did. And a funny Red Fox story. The first mm -hmm. time I met Red and Della and the whole cast was at uh, CBS and it was a promotional promo shoot for the show. And they just asked us to bring our own wardrobe. I think they had some things there, but they asked us to bring something they thought was right for the character. And so at the time, this is the early nineties, you know, Laura Ashley, those little, you know, those prairie looking uh, dresses. Everything was Laura dresses, Ashley dresses, at that time. That's yeah. right. So I come in and I'm wearing, the, they're setting us up and they pick out the, the dress for me to wear. Red looks over, over at me and he said, can't we get something else for her to wear? <laughs> and I said, Red, this is my dress. And he said, well, damn, let's take up a collection and buy this child some clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and, I said, and he said, he said, look, baby, you got a nice shape that you can't see it in that dress. This is show <laughs> business. You got to show him something. He made them pin up that dress. Wow. And then he looked and he said, now that's better. And then he looked again. He said, hey, can't we get her some socks or something for the chest? <laughs> they did. They did. And they did. They did. They did. And so, you know, mm. uh, so it, he said, now that's better. So I guess it meant for Red's approval. Uh, and he used to tease me unmercifully uh, during the set. He would, say, I would come out to rehearsals and he would say, where's your chest? And I'd say, because I had... <laughs> Um, what I called my, uh, you know, my Red Fox falsies and that, you know, that we wear on tape days. He would say, where's your chest? And I would say, it's in the, it's, a, it's in the, um, costume. He said, no, nah, no, nah, baby, you need to wear that shit all the time. Cause I have to look at you. Okay. Okay. In today's world, would that be considered harassment? I don't think so. It was, it was funny. I thought he was, he was Red Fox. He was being funny. I, you know, you can't take a joke. Um, so, but I got him back. You did, huh? I did. I, I went to the scenic department and I had them build out a, like, a, I don't even know if the alphabet goes that high, <laughs> <laughs> you know, double quadruple Z chest and it was latex and they uh. needed the right color and everything. And, and wardrobe got, you know, a great big blouse, breakaway blouse. We were shooting a, this, as a matter of fact, Red was not, he was in kind of, um, his health was a little we're dicey. starting to fail yeah. a little bit, yeah. So we would shoot the, um, our dress rehearsal the day before, we would shoot the dress and then instead of doing two shows before a live audience, we would only do one. But we always made sure we had a clean show in the can. Yeah. <laughs> so we're shooting the dress rehearsal. <laughs> Della is supposed to be making an entrance. She comes through the door. And if you know the show, you know the set. Grandpa's chair is is facing away from the door. Right. So he's he he gets up and around the chair. So she says, she says, Al, because his name was Alfonso, Al, come help me with these groceries. Gets up out of the chair to turn around and instead I open the door and I flash this chest and he goes like <laughs> it's like when he was on Sanford his son. It was yes. like, oh, it's like he the literally thing. did that. Martha, and, I'm coming. Yeah. And, 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 and everybody like the, the camera over. crew didn't know about it. And they're like, what the hell? And <laughs> and and Della said, she got you. She got you good, didn't she, she Red? Got you good. That you won't mess with anymore. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and and literally the next week he died. I think I killed him. I might have killed him. That, it's hard that to was... take it. No, I didn't. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know I mean? But yeah. he died a happy man. Got a happy man. <laughs> what was it like working with Della too? Oh, Della was a hoot. Della was a pistol. She was. She was, uh, 
a minister, an ordained yeah. minister. Yes. But she was very earthy, yeah. delicate, delicate, cussed like a sailor in the name of Jesus. And a new and you know, she right. could, she was she was like that, but she was absolutely she was at the the matriarch and she took care of us and she was very motherly. She was she was wonderful. I have been blessed to work with some wonderful people. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I, as much as I have, like I do stand up comedy now, really pretty much for the last 20 years. Yes, I know. I've been doing stand up comedy and solo shows, but I did not become an actor to do solo shows. I love working with an ensemble. Ensemble, right. I love playing, I love getting into the sandbox and playing with other people. So, and that's why I work so hard. We're going to make a little segue into what I'm doing now as a pro, as a pro age activist. I, I am yes. a self self proclaimed age anarchist. Yes. I want to dismantle all of the social structures that say that old is bad and young is good. You're an age full evangelist too. Yes. Yes. That's because cool. you know, when people say, Oh, you're ageless. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. I am not ageless. I am age full. I want credit for every single one of those years. You've earned because it. They have, absolutely. And um, and also my uh, my handle on Instagram, shameless plug, is Marianne all the underscore aging shamelessly. That's right. And that is my my mantra. We must because right now, especially for women. If you ask a woman her age, you know, we get coy. We don't want to say how old we are. There is shame attached to it. Why? I'm 73 years old. I'm proud to still be here. I'm grateful to still be here and to have a life that is full and is vibrant and vital and alive. And I think when we um, internalize you know, the, the shame of getting older, I, we do a tremendous disservice to ourselves. You know, we internalize that ageism. It affects our life. Um, a study was done at Yale University uh, by uh, Becca Levy. People who have a positive attitude about getting older live on average seven and a half years longer than those who don't. Um, <clears throat> I'm getting my seven and a half years, people. I don't know about you, but I'm getting my seven and a half years. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we just, so that's become, you know, my my mission and my purpose right now to. Um, it's a beautiful one. Yeah. And, and I've been very fortunate, um, you know, when during the pandemic, Clubhouse came along. I've been very mm. active on Clubhouse mm -hmm. as, a, on a, as I moderate a room on Tuesday nights and of intergenerational room about uh, aging and ageism. And <clears throat> when I would go into some of the new Hollywood rooms, I would go in there with the mission to some of the young Hollywood writers and producers and the shakers and movers. And I would make this proclamation, listen people, according to a 2017 Federal Reserve survey on consumer finances, women over the age of 50 own 70% of the wealth in this country so that when you do not include a nuanced, vibrant, layered, complex, older female character in your scripts, you're leaving money on the table. You are. Somebody heard me. Mm -hmm. Gino Brooks of the Artistic Standard heard me. And about he said, you are one of our queens. You should be working. Six months later, he DMs me and he says, give me a call. He said, I'm doing that, working on this project with AMC. He said, I'm mentoring young writer producers. I've got eight scripts and I've got one I think you would be perfect for. And so he, he said, I'm going to send you the script. Take a look at it. I read it. Wow. It was wonderful. Yeah. I, I play it. It's called Gumbo. And mm -hmm. I play a, a renowned uh, chef, food truck chef. And I have this recipe for gumbo that somebody wants to steal from me. Oh. Anyway, I um, so I read the script. Now, he was the producer. He was not the writer-director. 
the writer director is a wonderful young young person jess waters remember that name and so i tried to find out everything that i could about her and then i said to gino this was on a sunday this is on a sunday morning i said gino i can say yes to doing this but the the but you're the producer you're not just going to stick me in this show this the, that the writer director is going to be stuck with me they have to pick me too so he said great i'll set up a zoom we had a zoom later that sunday and jess waters is a young uh, she identifies they identify as um non-binary black uh uses female uses the gender pronouns she they i'm sorry and in her bio she said that she that they find it important that someone like them is represented in film and television and so as a as a young non-binary queer african-american female so when we were on the zoom together i said i saw what you said about how you want to see yourself represented as a young queer non-binary black female they said yes ma'am i and i said well i'm a old black female and i am very concerned about how i am represented too in film and television i said you have the character she's 60 and she's old i said can she be 73 my age she's, they said yes ma'am and i said and then baby you have her coming to the door talking about old and the fact that that and they're where she's wearing a muumu i said nobody i know wears a muumu these days <laughs> i said can she be wearing a tank top yoga pants and a cam and a and a kimono they yeah said, yes ma'am yeah said, then we got a deal and we had conversations during the shooting about the fact that even other disenfranchised people you know either dis disenfranchised by your sexual identity your ethnicity your religion whatever even those disenfranchised categories still discriminate against older people yes they do they, and we had a conversation about the fact that they hadn't really thought of it that way and that they were going to take another look at how they thought about old people and the irony is that getting older is the common denominator for everybody all of us right and when you discriminate against older people you're discriminating against your future self now how ridiculous is that so um i i find that a lot of my um fans now are women in hollywood who are in their late 40s you know early 50s they're just because they're looking for a positive representation mm -hmm. of what it's like to get older and they look at me and they think oh, not so bad i could do that you know exactly. so i kind of i think of that again i think like i said that's my i'm this is my ministry you know so that um people can feel good about getting yes old. exactly you've you done know? uh ted talks too what was that like uh it's funny i Somebody said, you should do a TED talk. And so I said, yes, I should. Yeah. And I, so I went to the TED um, website and I said, I said, oh, they have TED Chicago. Oh, shoot. I missed the deadline. I said, oh, there's a TED in Oak Park. I submitted what I wanted to talk about. Um, there was a screening process. There were 15 people. We had to audition. And I auditioned and they said, yes, we like you. And just this past year, they went back to doing live TED Talks again, and they invited me back to be the MC for the 2022 uh, TED Talks. I did my tw TED Talk in December of 2019, I believe. Yes. That is fun. right before That's the pandemic. Great. That is really, really fantastic. Wow. That is, that is amazing. Congratulations on that. Yeah. Oh, thank 
you. I love this too. I love this description. I'm a badass <laughs> boomer chick. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you see, during the during um, the pandemic, I start. I just let my hair grow. My hair is yes. Right here, I wear my hair natural. That's and I what I did too. Yeah, I was yeah. coloring it, and yeah, but you cut yours now. You cut it back a little bit. You yeah, a cut it back toe? a little bit. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, uh, so I stopped coloring my hair during the pandemic. Yeah. And went and I would just wear my hair piled up on top of my head, kind of like I have now. Yeah. And I would just wear a headband. Well, one day I took the, not one day, like I don't wash my hair, but it's like, and then one day I, I took the headband off and I noticed that there was a lot of gray, like the whole front top of my head was gray and then this was dark. And so I thought, well, maybe I just let my hair go gray. So for a couple of months, I just decided to let my hair go gray. And then when I got hired to do gumbo and I flew out to California, uh, Penny Johnson Gerald is one of my good friends. She's uh, she's on the Orville right now. She's on Seth MacFarlane's The Orville. And Penny's a decade and some change younger than me. But she works a lot. And so I asked her for her advice. I said, so Penny, what do you think? Should I let the hair go gray? And she said, no. I said, why? She said, no. She said, I... I Appreciate what you're going for, Marianne, but you know, it's still Hollywood and the way you look and your energy, the gray hair, it's just, it kind of is going to throw people off. So she's like said, a real shock to the system for people. So she said, go to my hairdresser. And so she sent me to her hairdresser. So now my hair is lighter. I don't know if you can see. It's a kind of a yes. sandy, sandy, sandy color. So it's lighter. So yeah. when the gray comes, you know, but I, and I'm kind of, I think, no, I think, I, I think I was always meant to be sort of a sandy blonde. What do you think? Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know. It works. Uh, you know what's a nice po photo is this. That's very nice. Yeah. We'll see. That's when my hair is down, but I. It's very nice. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks. I can look like that. See, and even in that one too, it's in the eyes. It's yeah. in the eyes. Yeah. <laughs> There's Dee Dee in there. <laughs> There's Dee Dee in there. Oh, that woman, that woman. Oh, there's OJ. Oh. Yes. Tell us about that. That was something uh, with OJ Simpson, that whole uh, production as well. Uh, yeah, that was, <laughs> I remember I got a call that, it was the morning of the audition, like at nine o'clock. And my agent said the audition was at 11 or something or noon. I just knew that I had to get dressed and get over there in a hurry. <clears throat> I got over there. I had an audition with Robbie Reed, who went on to become a, a casting director for Spike Lee, big casting director in Hollywood. But at the time she was an assistant. She called, was the one who called me in because she knew me from Edge of Night. Yes. So she called me in. I read. She said, great. She took me across the hall to the casting director. I read with her. She said, you know, wait. And I was there all day while I watched these, these actresses come in and audition. And a few got picked. And then the other ones went home. So finally it got down to about there were maybe six of us. And by now it's around four o'clock in the afternoon and I haven't eaten all day and I'm a little <laughs> cranky. Getting a little, yeah. A little cranky. <laughs> so it's my turn to go in. <laughs> and I remember <clears throat> it was a room full of the producers and the casting director and the director. They're all in there. Maybe about, maybe about six or seven people. The director starts to cough. And the casting director says, oh, can I get you some water? Do you, do you need anything? And we can get you, he says, I'm just getting a little cold or something like, just, well, can we can get you some aspirin. Let's get her some aspirin. And he says, no, 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 no. That's okay. I like to suffer. <laughs> I say, I, uh, if you really like to suffer, you should become an actor. It was like the room went silent. It's like, what did she just say? You really want to suffer, <laughs> become an actor. And the casting director is glaring at me like, mm. 
and the director is looking at me like, and then suddenly he bursts out laughing. He says, ha ha, become an actor, ha ha, suffer, that's so funny. And I got the job. Again, I got the job. For some reason, when I'm a smart ass, people hire me. I noticed that. And they want to bring you things. <laughs> they want to bring you aspirin. They want to bring you a cup of coffee. They want to bring you things. She needs like Red Fox and like some of the others. She's got to get this. She's got to. <laughs> you know, like you want to step up, become an actor. That's so funny. And then they, <laughs> then they hired me. And because um, when I left there, I thought there's no way. By the time I got home, I had the job. Um, yeah. You know, that was that was funny. And I remember somebody was talking to me about the character, my character, Dee Dee. And they said, oh, you know, when you're they're talking. And, and I remember OJ looking at me like, what was he? Because he thought they were talking about me as a real person, that I had been through this and not my character. Right. And I had to explain to him that I'd been on a yeah. soap opera. He had never watched it or you seen it. You were on Edge of Night, right. <laughs> but I, I never know. had a problem with him. And he was... Yeah. I think there were, I think the authentic person was always in service to the persona. So there might've been a split there somewhere. And yeah. I'm just going to leave that alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, this? Meshach. I yes. love working with Meshach. Oh, he was such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. And his wife, Bianca, was also on a she was on General Hospital, Bianca Ferguson. <clears throat> and I remember I, you know, I had recurred on Designing Women, and then I did this movie, uh, Class Act with him, where we both played rapper kids' parents. And I ran into Bianca later at an audition, and she said, <laughs> I remember she said to me, Girl, <laughs> you're in bed with my husband more than I am. <laughs> now she <laughs> Didn't really mean that, but we no, know but she, yeah. but she was she's very funny, you know, and she's and she's a lovely person as well. We kind of connect we, on yeah. Instagram, we stayed connected. She was on um Grey's Anatomy recently, yes. and I just sent her a little note because she did such wonderful work on that show. Yeah. Uh, playing Chandra's um mom, Bailey. And, and for the audience Definitely. watching, this particular show was from uh, that's from the movie Class Act. That's the movie, yes. You know, um, I think it's Dwight. He's like, please have her talk about designing women, designing women. Tell us about the designing women experience. Well, when I did designing women, they were going through a little bit of, you know, uh, Delta Burke's character. There was something that's going on. There was, still, there was a little bit of tension on the set. They were lovely, but they were little tension <clears throat> and um but that's why i say meshach was just a dream he was just a dream and as i recall it was a four-day shoot so everything was fast and i had 11 pages of dialogue that's a lot of dialogue that's about like about a third of the show and you know so i remember there's a scene when i come in and i'm turning around and i'm facing the women <laughs> and they're all looking at me like i hope she can get through this <laughs> I hope she can remember her lines. And I, because there was a, another person who was on the cast who was having a problem not remembering their lines. I'm not going to say who it was, but they were having a problem. And um, <clears throat> so I did it and it was cool every time. And I remember the third day before shoot day, Dixie Carter came over to me and she said, you know, we're just so used to being with each other that sometimes we forget our manners. And I just want you to know that you're doing just a lovely job. I mean, wasn't that sweet of her? Absolutely. And, you know, yes. And then I told her, I said, by the way, I said, I was on the edge of night. I know that you were too. And she said, Oh really? Yeah. So I kind of felt that, you know, yes, we're both from Monticello. Um, she was, she was really lovely. She was, she was, I mean, they were, they were all fine, but she was ex exceptionally gracious and Meshach was just a doll. Yeah. And Jean Smart was on too. Jean Smart was yeah. on. Yeah. If, if, you know, I only saw them because people would come out, do their work and go to their dressing rooms. So right. I only saw them on set. There wasn't a lot of chit chat. Right. Except that, that Meshach befriended me 
and kind of showed me the ropes. So yeah. we did have chit chat. And also he had lived in Chicago. So we talked about Chicago. We talked about food. We just talked about a bunch of stuff. And he made the whole experience uh, so much fun. Gone too soon, too early yeah. for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Very lovely human being. The uh, I was asking you, we were chatting about food before we went live on the air. And I said, well, Chicago, I would imagine, you know, boy, deep dish pizza has no. to be. And you were like, absolutely not. not. I do not <laughs> like pizza that's deep dish. I mean, have, have a quiche. You know, I like quiche. I don't like the deep dish. No, I, and when it comes to pizza, I am a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. Thin crust, lots of cheese. You fold it over, the cheese drips from the side, drips and you just the... try to get. That's the only. That's the only way to eat. The only pizza. way to do it. Nothing with a fork or knife. No. It's not. A, it's not a steak. <laughs> no, no. It's got. Do you, you like to cook? To fold it in. Oh, I do. I do. You love do. Yes. Yeah, what do you, do you have? Specialties? Is there a Marianne specialty? Uh, I have friends that I stay with in California. Um. I can mention them by name. Uh, Dave and Monique Fenoy. Dave is a renowned voiceover artist. They have a beautiful, large home. So, and, you know, when I stay there, they, they don't need to see me. They never see me. I'm just there or they can walk around. They don't, they don't even know if I'm there or not. But anyway, um, they came to see my solo show in LA and, and came up to me afterwards. And they said, you know, we were, Dave and I were talking. You really need to be in LA because you need to be working Whenever you need to be in LA, you can stay with us. And they have were gracious in opening their home to me. And um, uh, oh, what was the question? <laughs> I started talking about something else, and I went off on a tangent. What was you the were question? You were talking about uh, specialties, foods. That oh, specialties. Okay, yes, yeah. that's what it was. And so um, they said, you know, all you have to do though is like, you know, if you want to make that shrimp and grits every once in a while. So I am known for my shrimp and grits. Um, I, you know, I'm shrimp and grits. I make a, a pretty good uh, uh, chicken masala. Ooh. Not not chicken tikka masala, not yeah, the yeah. Indian dish, but the chicken masala. We got to get the masala wine, and then you reduce it and reduce it and reduce it. A lot of cream. Yeah. You know, a lot, but. You got to pound the chicken. It's it's a it's an all day thing, but it's really delicious. So chicken masala, um, I made pretty good. You know, like soul food, black eyed peas. Uh, I make you know whenever I make good salads because I put like black beans and corn, and I mm. make avocado and stuff. And you like, dress it up, yeah. Uh, of course, you don't want to. And I make my own salad dressings. So nice. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I like to cook and I, it's funny. People ask me for recipes. I can't give it to them because you just, it's on the spot. You're doing it as you're doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I go like, Oh, then let me try this. And That's what I do. Yeah. It's fun. Yes. Right. Isn't it fun? Yeah, it's fun. It's very creative. Yes. It's and it's like a science project. Right. Exactly. These concoctions, you know, you mentioned earlier, it's been like 20 years you've been doing, comedy tell us about that whole other side of you that some people that again know you from being a brilliant actress and, and everything else maybe not be as in tune with the comedian side of you comedian tell us about that well uh a storyteller is a storyteller yeah and good stand-up is really about you know telling stories i got into stand-up <clears throat> my uh, after my father died my my sister moved in, I mean, my mother moved in with my sister and her husband got a job transfer and they moved from Chicago to uh, New York. And my sister calls me up and she said, I would never ask you to come back to Chicago, but you can pursue your career in New York. You could use, you know, some help with mom. So I packed up from LA and moved to New York, moved in with my sister. When I got there, I realized, because I hadn't seen my mom in almost a year, and she had declined significantly. And they had bought a house on Long Island, in Westbury, Long Island. And I realized when I got there that I could not, there's, I couldn't audition during the day, because I could not leave my mother alone. Um, so to keep my sanity, 
I, I took a stand-up class with Linda Smith at Caroline's in New York. And my sister would come home from work. I would meet her on the, on the train platform, the Long Island Railroad. She would get off the train. I would take her train pass and I would go back into the city and I would come I'd take the, and then come back at midnight. And then after the class, I would just do gigs, open mics and stuff like that. And I would, and I did that to keep my sanity. So I, I started working at night because the days were not available to me. And I just started writing material um, and doing stand up. And it's great because I was able to turn to that because all you need is a mic. You just show up, you can tell a story. Uh, I didn't need a theater per se. I didn't need to produce anything, but I got a chance to hone my craft in as much as I got to uh, tell a story in front of an audience. Now, at the beginning, it was uncomfortable for me because I thought, because I, I think I told you at the beginning, I, I didn't become an actor to say, look at me, look at me, look at me. It, it really was to communicate. So the idea of just being on stage telling a story that look at me, I was very uncomfortable with it until I decided to make the audience my scene partner. Mm. So I thought I would look into the audience and connect with people. And, you know, my comedy, you know, my delivery would change according to what I was getting back from the audience. Right. You know, I would lean in or I glue back and I would go, hmm. Or if they weren't laughing, I would like, you know, I would, I was going to get my laugh. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, so it became uh, very therapeutic. You know, like I said, I think it kept my sanity, it kept me going. And until at this point in time now that I believe, I'm going to skip around here. Uh, several years ago, I was at a party and I met this man by the name of Brian Hurst, who is a coach, holistic coach, spiritual coach. And he said to me, Marianne, when you are not there, you're the thing that's missing. So that when you are there, people will go, ah, that's what was missing. And I think it's time for me to come back to television because I'm what's missing. Mm. You know, it's like, yeah. Who I am as a person, how I represent women of my generation, that's what's missing in television today. And I, I want to go back to represent for my people. For the, Absolutely. For yeah. us feisty, baby boomer, badass boomer chicks. Right. Exactly. Exactly. What did you think of uh, Hot in Cleveland with uh, Betty White and that whole group? That, that was an interesting mix. It you know. was, and I also love Grace and Frankie. Yes, that's a, that's another great show that I think represents older people. The Golden a, Girls, of course. Golden Girls. I love the Golden Girls. I love designing women. Yeah. Um, but I will say, what is missing is diversity on that show. Right. You know, it's like, hello, where are the women of color? You know, um, uh, which I hello. Women of color. Yeah, she's available. Um, I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> hello. Yeah. Um, uh, and so when they talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, a lot of times age is not included in that. So it shouldn't be just D-E-I. It should be diversity, equity, inclusion, ageism, and ableism. Because yeah. everybody should, everybody, you know, everybody should be able to get a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. So, right. um, and, and also looking at the population just from an audience um, point of view, there are so many of us. Mm -hmm. And and I do know, one of the things that I know from the women who come to see my shows uh, is that, because my show has comedy, but it also has some very poignant moments. I talk about yeah. being, I, um, about losing someone dear to me to yeah. death. And I also mm -hmm. talk about um, my being a cancer survivor and yeah. how I experienced that. There are women who come up to me. I had this woman say to me, were you on my, were you a fly on, where were you in my bedroom? Cause you are telling my story. Yeah. You know, they're the connecting. 
they're connecting. And, you know, and so I, I make, you know, like I said, this is my ministry. I come out and I do a meet and greet after the shows. People just want to come up to me and hug me and just say thank you. And, and that's when I know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's when I know that uh, as much as I'm able to reach people in a theatrical setting, I can reach people a broader platform. I need a bigger platform, television. I love doing television. So I can reach more people. So I can touch their hearts and tell their stories. Absolutely. This is your website address too, which is great. It's a fabulous website that you have. People can connect with you there as well. Um, again, the aging shamelessly. I think that's so cool. What what are the what are the visions that you have for that to to grow that and to expose it to more people and bring more people in? And what are some other projects as well that you're very excited about that you might want to share? Well, I just finished a project. I think I told you at the beginning, Ben and Tony. It's a sitcom. Uh, that I don't want to talk too much about, but it's called Ben and Tony. It's very funny. And it's, uh, it's a diverse comedy. Um, uh, the characters, older characters, we all went to high school together. I think I can tell this much. We all went to high school together. And my character, my, I was a little privileged kid. Daddy was a doctor, mommy was a socialite. Went to private schools. At the age of 13, puberty, my, my dad leaves my mom for a white woman. And suddenly we don't have the kind of money that we used to have and I, I am now we have to move to a different neighborhood and now I have to, for the first time in my life, I go to public school. Well, I meet these two boys or these two boys meet me. They think I'm cute. And, and so they befriend me and kind of show me the ropes. And at the end of high school, I end up marrying one of them. We moved to New York. We think we're going to be in a band and have this career. It flops. I come back home and uh, I end up marrying the other guy. And we have two boys and I end up divorcing him because I don't know why I divorced him. I guess he's kind of boring. <laughs> and um, <laughs> And so I become sort of a serial, you know, as, as one of my exes, Tony says, you know, I look at marriage as my, my career, getting married and I get married and divorced. But, uh, and these, and both of the men are, are white. Uh, and so there is diversity. And the fact is that, um, and I looked at it, the fact that, you know, my dad left my mom for a white woman. So guess what? There will never be another black man in my life. Oh, I've been married. And so I married these two white guys, which I think as an interesting twist, yeah. you're not seeing that a lot and it brings in diversity. So you'll bring in our, our biracial children. You'll bring in the, at some point in time that we're going to bring in the, the, because my dad has since died. My mother is moving in with me, but the woman that my mother, I mean, that let, that my father left my mother for is still alive. And suddenly she's in the picture and she was much younger than my mother closer to my age so now she's got eyes on one of my ex-husbands and i'm thinking oh no 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 not happening it's not yeah. happening so there's a lot there's there's a lot of uh content there's a lot of gold yeah, in yeah. there that can a be mine. dynamic yeah yeah that sounds cool that's exciting is there a, a target date when they hope it'll be out for people to see or is it still in development and production and well we sh we shot the pilot and now the pilot. They're, they're shopping it around now they now they do you know they're, they're shopping knocking around. on the doors right yeah right, they're shopping which... around and uh, we'll, you we'll better see shop it. around, You're right? Oh uh, yeah, okay. I'm not yeah that's a... <laughs> My mama told me you, you better, better shop, shop around. around. Oh, you're you're older than yeah. You, know, you think? I think you look okay. But anyway, <laughs> why? Because my voice went lower. <laughs> no, no, no. Because you know that song. Yes, no. I'm I'm a versatile host. You have oh, to know. Right. And you yes, you know. You talk about aging shamelessly. We have somebody here that usually comes in uh, during the show as well who aged shamelessly as well till I think like 100. Mr. George Burns. <laughs> hey, 
talk God. about aging yes, shamelessly. Yes. He smoked his cigars. He did his thing and he yeah. just enjoyed it, you know, and, you know, didn't uh, worry about any of that, you know, made it to a hundred. <laughs> How about that? That's and, yeah. and Betty White did too. Tell Betty I said hello. Yes, Betty. Yes, George. Tell Betty and, and all the others. Uh, and Red and Della. Yes, yes, and Red. And, and God rest her soul, Naya Rivera, who played my, she played my daughter, my four year old daughter on the royal family. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. What, what continues to bring you such great blessing and joy in your life? Yeah. I mean, you've, you've uh, certainly done that for everybody else through comedy, through drama, through, you know, your passionate way of approaching things, your inspiring and empowering way about you through all of the characters on the soap operas, television shows, on stage, all of it. And now, of course, what you're doing with Aging Shamelessly, which is which is really legacy work. Uh, what are some of those things that continue to inspire you, motivate you, and give you great blessing and joy in all of this work, Mary? Uh, I... My, um, I have one overriding uh, credo, and that is that talent is what God gives to you, and what you do with it is your gift to God. So I want to make sure that I am using all of my gifts, all of my talents and abilities, to uh, to give back to God, which means I'm giving it out to the world. So that's and that gives me great joy and great satisfaction. I couldn't not do what it is that I do because that would be that would be the greatest sin to me. So even when things don't seem to be going the way that I would like them to go, I always think, well, God's got a better plan, you know, and I and I let it go at that. I I was raised Catholic. I am what what you would call a lapsed Catholic. I am a seeker. I explore, but I do believe in a higher power. And my idea of prayer is, yo, God, can we talk? Can we get, you know, I don't understand. So you got to explain it to me. So, I mean, I have a, a direct relationship with God. And I'm just, uh, I realized that this experience that we call life, um, I didn't have to exist. An egg got together with a sperm, these two people, and it made me. Um, what if they had met, uh, met other people? Would I still be me? Would I still be here? So the fact that we are all here, we are all miracles. So I am just grateful that I get to experience in this thing called life. And, uh, you know, and I'm going to have a party while I'm here. No, I don't know. I think you're a pearl that came out of an oyster. <laughs> 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 and, you know, and and I have uh, that wouldn't be too shabby, huh? <laughs> no, no. But, yeah, can I be a diamond that came out of a piece of coal? Yes. Okay, let's be a diamond. And in the rough. <laughs> in the rough. Um, but I have uh, um, my son is is forty eight now. Uh, I will be seventy four in May. There's a six month difference, Happy even though it's different years. Happy birthday to years. you. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, but he. When he, when I turn 75, six months later, he will be turning 50. And so I'm trying to convince him that we should do something big, that we should have a joint celebration, that maybe we should jump out of an airplane. He's, he's Ooh. not, he's not big on that. So, and, so then that. I said, well, maybe we should rent a villa in Tuscany and just invite all the family. And now, party. now you're talking, yeah. huh? <laughs> he said, I think I like that one. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he's leaning more towards that one. And so that's we'll when we will have you come back and I will do the show from the villa in Tuscany. <laughs> <That's kidding. laughs> <laughs> the on location episode of the Jay Master Show Live. You are uh, amazing. Really, really are. And I just want to show you some of the uh, viewers watching internationally around the world who join us and, and anybody that's watching right now and you're watching this, you know, after hey, it's everybody. live. We welcome you, all the live viewers and anybody that watches this in the archives, the replay. You'll be able to see this episode 24-7 uh, on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. So subscribe to the channel 
and give us uh, some love. I'm a subscriber. I'm a subscriber. I know <laughs> you are, and I love it. High five, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's it. It takes a village, right? It yeah. takes a village. Nikki says, thank you, Marianne. Uh, this has been a great conversation. You're an inspiration. Maybe even a <laughs> pearl or diamond, right? Okay. Thank you, Nikki. Dwight, uh, who wanted to know uh, very much about Designing Woman and, and much more. Marianne, you are a living legend, truly inspiring, wonderful spirit. Aww, thank you, Dwight. Jane watching in Sweden, one of our regular faithful lovities uh, in beautiful Sweden. She says, I hope I have that same energy as you, Marianne, when, if, no, not if, when, when you Jane, do when. reach that age so alert and fun smile 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 in north carolina christine says marianne you sure have had so many opportunities in your career really wonderful shows to be a part of thanks for sharing your interesting stories of your life your career i wish you continued success uh, thank isn't that you. yeah I, I love all these great comments uh sherry larson is in kansas usa thank you marianne for sharing your wonderful career with us love your work on pushing aging shamelessly. Love your bubbly personality oh, as thank well. You. Thank and you Kathleen much. Walker says, thank you for being here, Marianne. Fun show, Merlin in Yay. Canada. Marianne, it's been a blast meeting you and thanks. Love that. Really, really cool stuff. And it has been. Uh, we will definitely keep the porch light on for you. You're welcome back anytime. Spread the word thank about you. our uh, series. We're doing something special and unique here. Sort of bringing back that lost art of conversation. Um, I don't even call these interviews. I call them conversations and we'll keep that Porsche light on for you, Marianne. And I, and I hope the show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I have definitely with you. Well, I, I had no expectations, but you met all of them. I don't know what that means. I'm just being a smartest. Yeah. I like but it. No, they, suffice it to say, I had a great time. You're, you are, uh, wonderful conversationalist. I never felt like I was being interviewed at all. We just, just kind of flowed. I had a great time. You're a doll. And um, I, I'm just grateful to be here. And thank you, Lisa Rodrigo, for making this connection because absolutely she's the one that got she's, us together. She's a, she's a long time lovety on the Gym Master Show Live. Absolutely. Um, you know, whenever, but I've said this a couple of times on the show, I've shared it on this show and, and some others I've do, do professionally. And I said, my father has always said, when somebody says something nice to you and kind, ask them to please put it in writing and address it management. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, yes. I, when I, when I get really good service, uh, you know, especially, you, you know, young people, if I'm in yeah. a supermarket or Best Buy or whatever, I have actually gone to the management and said, can I speak to the manager and yeah. tell them you have an excellent employee here. I right. do that. I've also said to some kids, your mother should be, you are such a kind, you're such a good person. Does your mother know that? I don't know. Give me her email address. I've written emails to mom saying, you have done a great job raising your child. Wow. Mothers need to hear that. I think that's important. And then they Google your name and they go, say what? <laughs> Dee Dee? That happens, that's, that's happened a couple of times too. But, yeah. but, you know, I do because I think it's important. I think, and this is the thing too, compliments have become a lost art. They if really you, have. If you see something... That you think, oh, that's a pretty, that looks nice on her, or I love her hair, or that looks, say something. You're exactly. going to make somebody's day. Don't hold it in. Right. They, they say, if you see something, say something. You see that on all the billboards, but it also means when it is something kind as well. You know what I mean? And that's so important. Oh, um, Lisa just said, love you. And yes. We yes. love everybody Spread here. Spread the nice levity. That's what it is. It's all about the levity here on our show. And uh, that just sort of fell out of my mouth when I said light, love, and levity. And I said it too fast. And it's been golden ever since. You're now a levity, Marianne. There's no turning back. Um, and, and, uh, and why would I want to go back? I'm a levity. You are a levity for sure. And I think you've been one for years. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. You're right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank That's you. A, so when you go into the supermarket this time, you can say, 
you know what? I became a lovey on the Jim Masters show last night. <laughs> they were like, what? <laughs> that's really cool. You're the best and you roll with it. And that's what I love. And yeah. uh, you're a very spirited, empathetic person. And, and we need more of that. And I'm very in tune with that uh, way of thinking uh, as well. Well, and, like attracts like, Jim. That's why. You know, it really does. They're all like that. Kathleen in New York City says, welcome to our family, Lovety family, Marianne. So, so you're in. <laughs> and you don't have to do dishes either <laughs> when you're part of this, when you're part of this family. <laughs> yeah. I, I might make shrimp and grits every once in a while, but somebody Ooh, else is going to have to clean up. That sounds so good. Dinner at Marianne's. Get on the plane. We're heading to Chicago. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne, for all the time, the wit and wisdom. It really was a blessing. Thanks, Do you know that we uh, just let, we let it roll? We don't script anything. There's no questions. You had no idea what I was going to ask. You had no idea what you know content we were going to show or any of that. And we have chatted uh, right around two hours. Oh, wow. It doesn't seem like it, right? Time flies when you're having a good time, doesn't it? That's right. That's what the guest's saying. I think it's a beautiful thing. You enjoy the rest of your uh, okay, evening, you my friend, and okay. we will chat again soon. Let's stay in touch. And, Absolutely. Uh, loved having you here. You're a really uh, a beautiful person inside and out. It was my pleasure. And bye to all the lovinies. That's it. That's it. And happy pre-happy birthday. Thank you. To Thank you. you. Thank many, you. many, many, many more happy and healthy. You Absolutely. take care. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye now. Marianne Alda, isn't she amazing? Right here on the Gym Masters Show Live. Gang, if you would like to uh, check out her website, we do. We showed it earlier. We'll show it again for you. There is her website. She is amazing, isn't she? Now, what's really cool about what we do here on the show is uh, maybe you've followed her for years uh, from her work on television and film and so much more. And you knew her from some of those roles that we talked about. And she's done a lot more than just, you know, what we touched upon tonight. Um, we just wanted to sprinkle in some of the roles uh, that you didn't either know about or some of the ones that you have followed uh, for a long time. Plus some of the other things that she does, again, the ageless, uh, the aging shamelessly is such a beautiful thing she's doing and she's a comedian and so much more and just absolutely love it. You know, um, she's also done hosting over the years as well. And we actually have a little something to show you here. Here's her hosting. From first home to ultimate dream house idea hunting with Mary Ann Alda. Suppose this house was your house and you wanted to change it. Make it the wonderful, imaginative house you always wanted. What could you do? Well, you could call the Connecticut architectural firm of Moore, Grover, and Harper and ask for Mark Simon. He says it's a challenge, but... Marianne Alder was a featured player in the royal family, an early CBS attempt to build a show around a predominantly black cast. I've been a woman and black all my life. But not even that prepared me for the discrimination I would face once I got to be old. For more than 30 years, I made my living as an actress. But when I turned 50 and the casting director stopped calling and my agent suggested that I gain 50 pounds so that I could do more character work, my response was, oh, hell no. The media has hypnotized us into believing that women lose value as they get older. Okay. Especially when it comes to their sexual viability. And I'm about changing all of that because I think women get smarter and more comfortable with themselves and mm -hmm. their bodies. We know a little more, we have a few more tricks, we know some stuff, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. We have more confidence and we take good care of ourselves, you know? Yeah. And I think that, you know, we got a little something, something going on that people aren't paying attention to, and I'm about making them pay attention. Oh, hell yeah! Cool stuff, huh? Cool stuff. Just a little bit more to show you uh, some of it an encore and some of it fresh stuff as well. We had a Really, really fantastic time with uh, Marianne. 
and we thank her. We will definitely have her back here on our show. She's always working on cool things, really working on some amazing projects. And again, uh, these are just some of the photos that we showed uh, during the course of the broadcast. And uh, if you'd like to see this episode again, you can because it's saved right here on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. There's over 640 episodes we have done since launching this series back in late April. We're almost coming up on two years of our anniversary. Just hit that red subscribe button, gang, on our YouTube channel. We would love that. Look what happens. You're part of the Lovely family. And don't forget also to uh, give this episode a like and leave a comment for us uh, as well. And again, whenever you see that logo, you know you're going to have a really, really good time with us. We thank our very special guest, uh, beloved actress, uh, daytime soap star for so many years, noted speaker, and uh, like I said, a beautiful person inside and out, Marianne Alda here on the Jim Master Show live. Really, really fantastic. Look who's with us tomorrow. Another uh, fabulous legend, actress and TV legend, author of my four Hollywood husbands. That's her new memoir. The one and only Joyce Boulafant. You know her from the Mary Tyler Moore Show and so much more. She's going to be with us tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. I can't wait for that. Join us again. She is a Hollywood legend. Then a dear friend of mine, Gianna Valenti, Italian singer, songwriter. We worked on a PBS special together. Uh, we've been friends for years. She's going to be with us on Friday live here on our show. Again, uh, we've known each other for a long time and uh, going to be talking about some new cool projects. And uh, we actually worked on a PBS uh, national special together and went to Venice uh, and it was just really cool. We'll talk more about that on Friday. If you didn't see the episode when Glenn Scarpelli was with us from one day at a time, boy, it was a very open and revealing and authentic episode. He got real. He opened up about his life in ways he hasn't done previously. And it was really beautiful. Um, and we talked about his career and projects and all kinds of cool things, but new things. If you didn't see that episode, it's on our YouTube channel right now. Also want to let you know that coming up on Saturday. Um, so tomorrow is Joyce. And then my friend, uh, the wonderful Jada, she's here on Friday. And then on Saturday, another incredible talent, the son of actress, Marion Ross, who you know from Happy Days, impressionist, comedian, voice artist, extraordinaire, hilariously funny, Jim Meskimen. And there you can see the photo with him and his mom, Marion Ross, Mrs. C from Happy Days. He's here on Saturday night. It's going to be amazing. You know who's here on Sunday afternoon? Cousins Gibb. Yes, they are the family of the Bee Gees, the Gibb family. Um, Nick Endicott Gibb is the son of Maurice, and Deborah is uh, his cousin. And they are going to be with us on Sunday here on the Gym Master Show Live, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, and 7 p.m. in the United Kingdom, Ireland as well. And then we may have a surprise for you on Sunday night the childhood celebration episode we're talking about last call gang is Friday this Friday by midnight to get your childhood photo to us. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we're putting together a host lovety episode. We have great guests, but we also do host lovety episodes, which you and I and our viewers commenting and participating from all around the world. We've done many of those types of special episodes of the Gym Master Show Live. And we're putting one together celebrating our childhoods. Yes. So you can send in a photo, one photo of you as a kid. It could be a baby. You could be 12 years old, whatever it is. But you're a kid. And we're going to show it here on the air on the upcoming episode of the Gym Master Show Live. It is celebrating childhood episode, love the episode. So get those photos to us if you haven't done it yet. This Friday is the end date by midnight Eastern time Friday. We have to have received it. And you can email those to gymmasterstv at gmail.com. That's gymmasterstv at gmail.com. Uh, many of our lovely viewers have sent their photo in. And uh, you guys are cuties. <laughs> but if you haven't yet, gang, get it to us by this Friday so we can uh, 
show it around the world on our show on the upcoming episode. So uh, stick with us. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. You might, um, you know, you might uh, see it happening on Sunday night. We've got Cousins Gib in the afternoon, uh, which is going to be amazing. Family of the Bee Gees. And thank you very much. Do Better America. Welcome to the Gym Master Show Live. So great to have you here. And uh, we just love having you here. So you guys are the best. And um, you're looking forward to seeing everybody's uh, photos from the childhood celebration episode we're doing at the Gym Master Show Live. This is going to be absolutely cool. We're going to love it. Thank you, Jim. Great show. Thank you, Kathleen. And um, that was fun. Thank you so much. Just got a little private message from our very special guest, uh, Marianne Alda. She really enjoyed herself uh, tonight. She just sent a, a private message in chat here. It, there's a private chat that we have as well with the guests sometimes when the show is on. In case there's something they need to uh, relay, we can chat with each other while the show is on. Thanks for having Marianne as a guest tonight. Lots of wonderful special guests coming up. Jim, good night, Jim and Lovities. You as well. Christine in North Carolina watching us we love it and uh good stuff thanks for all the the love yes yay lovety her you got it lisa absolutely i absolutely concur i second that emotion and it's so great to have her here uh on lovety hall or in lovety hall on the gym master show live so many great shows coming up again all for you we're approaching we're just shy of 650 episodes day in and day out and it's been extraordinary what we do is something very special it's it's unique we don't just do videos we don't call these interviews we call these conversations we do it like a television series because of my background for years in television and radio uh, in stage and film on the air and, and continuing to work busy day for me actually i was at the pbs studio and we were filming segments for upcoming pbs specials which are airing actually starting this weekend which is really great i've been working with public television for years and uh, and love it. It's one of the many hats I wear in the industry. Good night all, sending love and hugs to Sherry in Kansas. You as well. You as well. Yes, and, and Jane is still looking for a childhood photo. Yeah, you have till Friday, so uh, dig deep, dig deep and send us. You know, you could be a baby in a, in a bassinet, uh, however you want to do it. <laughs> but... Uh, Get it to us because we might actually do it uh, this weekend. And uh, we need a Jim Masters doll. I, you know, I like that idea. A couple of people have suggested that. It's sort of like a, uh, I used to have a ventriloquist doll. I love ventriloquism. So I should get a ventriloquist doll. Uh, that would be kind of cool. Good idea, Dwight. I know you enjoyed yourself tonight. Uh, and we are, we enjoyed our time with all of you, gang. You're the best. We have such a great community here, and we're very interactive with all of you, and that means a lot to me, gang. Don't forget to find your Zen place. I love the ocean. That's one of the Zen places for me. Share the lovity. Uh, another Zen place for me is my uh, work in television, radio, stage, and film over the years. I absolutely love it. And... Uh, Spending time with all of you, too. Global lovely hugs from Christine. I agree. And uh, Jane in Sweden says goodnight, everyone. Uh, Marianne and Jim as well. To all of you from us here at the Gym Master Show Live. We're going to sign off. We never say goodbye. We say see you later. Slancha, shalom, avida zain, sayonara, moi loop, uh, ciao. Uh, but we don't say uh, goodbye. Thanks for being with us, gang. Just looking at some of these comments that are still coming in. Thanks for all the lovity, all the uh, excitement. And you guys have a great rest of your day. Now, that's for the live audience. But if you're watching this where it's already uh, in the archives and the replay, stay right here and binge watch our incredible episodes that are here for your pleasure and your viewing enjoyment on the Gym Master Show live. Be well, gang. Take care of one another. Be good to one another. And we'll see you on the next episode. Uh, Joyce Boulefant. It'll be a good show tomorrow. We look forward to it. Take care and be well. Cheers.